All right, so let's talk about um, covalent bonding in Lewis dot diagrams. Lewis dot diagrams are illustrations of how the um, elements in a covalent bond come together to form a new, come together to form a structure or a molecule. So there are lots of ways they can share those valence electrons. They can come together within a single bond sharing only two valence electrons. They can come together in a double bond sharing four valence electrons. Or they can come together in a triple bond sharing six valence electrons between the two atoms. All right, there's also something called a coordinate covalent bond. Typically, when you think of two elements coming together to share valence electrons, the one's coming from one atom, the other's coming from the other atom. But sometimes, if two valence electrons will come from a single atom, a single atom will just give up two of its electrons and share. That's called a coordinate covalent bond. Um, and the main thing we also want to get through is the octet rule. We want to say all atoms have a goal of having eight electrons around it. That, don't forget, eight electrons is the same thing as having an electron configuration as a noble gas, which is exactly what we want. Stable, good, nice. So um, all, all atoms are going to want eight valence electrons around it. The two exceptions mainly are going to be hydrogen, which is just too tiny to have that many around. It only wants two. And boron, which is also pretty small. They, that guy only wants six. But everybody else wants eight. All right, so let's take this into action. All right. When we're putting this up, if we have an example of NF3 or nitrogen trifluoride, we're going to put the least electronegative atom in the center because that guy is going to be sharing a lot of its electrons. And we know electronegativity, something that's highly electronegative, is going to want to hog all those electrons. So it doesn't want to share. So because fluorine's highly electronegative, we're going to put nitrogen in the middle. It's going to be our central atom. And fluorine's going to be surrounding the nitrogen. OK. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to say, OK, how many electrons are we working with in this particular compound? Well, nitrogen's in group 5, so it has 5. Fluorine's in group 7, and there's 3 of them. So it's 7 times 3, which is 21. So we have 26 electrons in this hole that we're working with in this whole uh, molecule. So we know they're bonded together in some way. And we're going to denote that by the lines connecting them. In each line, we're going to say there's 2 electrons. So we just use 2, 4, 6 electrons. Those are already used up. So now we have 20 electrons to work with. OK. But the most electronegative atom is going to want to be the guy who hogs all the electrons around it. So that's fluorine. So we're going to start giving, it, giving up the electrons to fluorine. So we're going to say, OK, we have 20 of them. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18. So we use up 18. And those guys have 8 around it. 2, 4, 6, and 2 are shared here. That's 8, so that's good. 2, 4, 6, 2 are shared here. That's 8. That's perfect. 2, 4, 6, 8, that's perfect. Um, we have two electrons left. Nitrogen has 2, 4, 6, because don't forget those are shared between them. And the two left over, making everybody have 8 around it. Fantastic, awesome. So this is what um, nitrogen trifluoride looks like in a Lewis dot diagram. Let's look at um, carbon disulfide. OK, the most electronegative atom in this case is sulfur, so we're going to make carbon the central atom and have sulfur surrounding it. Let's figure out how many valence electrons we're working with here. We have four from carbon because it's in group four, plus um, six from sulfur because it's in group six, times two is 12. Four plus 12 is 16. So we have 16 electrons in this whole thing. All right, so they're going to be bonded somehow, like we said. OK, so we just, lo we just uh, used up four electrons, two from here and two from here. So we now have 12 electrons left. OK, so the most electronegative atoms are going to get these electrons. So again, we have 12, so we're going to say they're going to go on sulfur. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. Fantastic. This guy has 8 around it. 2, 4, 6, 8 from this. It's happy. This guy has 2, 4, 6, 8 around it. It's happy. But carbon, poor carbon, only has 4. It needs 2, it needs four, two, two more pairs. So what's going to happen? Well, sulfur is going to be nice enough to actually give up its electrons and say, don't worry, carbon. I'll take care of you. I will bond with you. So now we have what we call a double bond. Carbon has 2, 4, 6, 8, and everybody is happy. OK? Good. Awesome. We're good here. That's their use of double bonds. And notice that when sulfur gave up its electrons, that's a coordinate covalent bond. Let's look at um, a polyatomic ion, cyanide. cyanide. Polyatomic ions are covalently bound together. So they also have shapes. So in this case, there's only two, so it doesn't matter which one's a central atom or which one's more electronegative. Carbon has four electrons. So we're going to say 4 because it's in group 4. Nitrogen's in group 5. It has 5 electrons. Plus, we have an extra 1 that's given here. So we're going to have plus that extra 1. So we have 10 electrons total. All right, they're connected somehow. So we use 2. So we have 8 left. 
And they're gonna go around the nitrogen first, two, four, six, and we have two left over, eight. But again, nitrogen's happy, carbon's not. What's gonna happen? They're gonna coordinately covalent bond here. Carbon now is six, nitrogen's gonna say, okay, I'm gonna give it up. Here's an example of a triple bond. This is the maximum amount of electrons that can be shared between two atoms. And we also know that this is a polyatomic ion. We added an extra electron in there, so we wanna denote that. We're gonna put it in brackets and say, I added an extra electron to this, to this structure to make it look like this, okay? Um, so this is essentially um, all the different ways you can, they can combine in single, double, and triple bonding, but there are also like exceptions to this, so let's talk about those. There are things called resonance structures, and resonance structures are when two, one or more valid LDD can be drawn. So let's look at this and, and show you what I'm talking about. We're gonna do it the same exact way we did the other ones. Um, we're gonna put our most electronegative atom on the outside and our least electronegative atom on the inside. So sulfur is our least electronegative atom, and so it's gonna go be our central atom, and the oxygen's gonna be surrounding it. Okay, fair enough. Um, sulfur has six, it's in group six. Oxygen has six, it's in group six. There's three of them, so there's 18. So we have, uh, what is that, 24 electrons to work with. They're gonna be connected, so two, four, six, I use six of them. I have 18 left. Okay, so they're gonna go around oxygen because they're the most electronegative. One, two, I'm sorry, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18. Fantastic, all these oxygens are totally happy. They have eight electrons around, they're fine. Poor sulfur only has six. So what are we gonna do? Well, we could easily say this guy is gonna give it up and share. But why that oxygen? Why does that oxygen have to share and not this one? Well, that's the whole thing. That's resonant structures, right? So it can be that one or it can be that one. Or it can be the other one. And when we denote all three structures, we have to draw all of them and put a double arrow in both of them saying these all actually exist. This double bond actually exists in all three of these places. This guy will share sometimes, this guy will share sometimes, and this guy will share sometimes. Um, electrons are constantly moving, so they're able to actually share all these electrons. Resonant structures are the, the changing of the bonding, not the structure of the actual thing. I'm not moving any elements around, I'm just changing the bonding, okay? The, um, one of the last things is radicals, that's an odd number of electrons. That will just have, this one, they'll just have an odd number, so instead of everything being paired, there's gonna be just one left over. That's extremely highly reactive. You're probably not gonna come across these very often. They're very, very reactive. If you think of like free radicals, you've probably heard that before. That is something that you've had in, um, that are just, that create, like cancer gets created by free radicals, things like that, so you wanna destroy them, they're not good. Um, expanded octets are things that can have actually more than the eight. Um, they can have, you can, anything that has uh, above period three means that they have those inner shell electrons of the D available. So they can actually have more than eight. Um, some can have up to 12 um, valence electrons. PCL5 is an example. Um, it can have, the, the, pho the phosphorus around it will actually have 10 if we were to draw it. Um, it's sharing 10 electrons with the chlorine ions because um, phosphorus is able to do that because it actually have access to the d orbitals. So that pretty much sums up Lewis dot diagrams in a nutshell.